Welcome to the 2024 Urban Chat Series. Uh, if uh, you've seen this flyer before, you know you're in the right place. So uh, really excited to have, have Brian Pronti here with us today with uh, from Summit County Soil and Water Conservation District up north. And um, so he's the district program administrator there. So we'll be talking about green infrastructure fundamentals, the design functionality and maintenance insights. So Brian teaches a class with an Ohio State uh, professor each year. And this is a really trimmed down version of that. Uh, we've gone to his class. I highly recommend it. Um, maybe Brian can talk about that at some point, but it's a great class. Really good overview of different types of post-construction green infrastructure methods. Um, and he'll be covering the kind of pretty good overview of those today. And so I'm seeing a lot of um, MS4 um, contract folks here from, from the county, different municipalities. And so it's great to have you all here today. And we're really trying to promote um, installing more of these practices around the county for, um, you know, runoff reduction and things like that for stormwater quality control and stuff like that. So um, with that being said here, I've got a couple slides for you. So um, this this uh, webinar will be recorded. We'll be uploading it to our YouTube page. And that's where our YouTube page is at. So you can go there and find all of our other past Urban Chat videos if you have interest in those. We will be offering a PDH uh, credit today. So I'll get certificates sent out to everyone, any anyone that attends. And I think you can use that for like your PE licenses. So uh, youtube.com slash at Warren County SWCD. And then also, if you guys want some more information um, on technical guidance on these practices, we'd like to point you to Ohio EPA's website, their Rainwater and Land Development Manual. It's kind of like our, our guiding document for all stormwater things related. And um, Today's info, can you can kind of find that in chapter two on post-construction stormwater management practices. And uh, so you can see their different runoff reduction practices, um, extended, you know, detention basins, previous pavement, uh, bioswales, things like that. And also want to just give a quick kind of shout out to South Lebanon. They installed this bioretention swale uh, partly funded through our Operation Rain Garden grant. So we awarded them, I think, $20,000 for, for this project. Uh, cost a lot more than that, so we were able to pitch it and help a little. So if anyone's interested in that program, reach out to our office. But pretty cool swale, bio swale here with gravel, filter media in the bottom, uh, water-loving plants, rain garden-type plants along the sides there. Then you have a it's kind of like an L-shaped, and then at the end there, you got a dry well. So um, having some good infiltration type soil is going to be important, I think. Like we have up in Carlisle, some really good sandy soils up there. So, <laughs> so if you go to our website, warrenswcd.com, check out our Operation Rain Garden Grant Program. It's kind of being revamped right now, so I think we'll be accepting applications next year or 2026 maybe. But keep an eye out, reach out to our office if you would like to apply to that program for installation of rain gardens or other water quality bioretention practices on public lands in Warren County. And at that point, I think we'll pass it over to Brian, but uh, I do want to read Brian's um, bio real quick. So I'll stop sharing. And Brian, you should be able to share your screen. So Brian Prunty has over 22 years of experience in the stormwater industry. For the past 13 years, he has been employed with Summit SWCD, overseeing the office and its programs. Brian started his career at the onset of the MS4 stormwater permit, developing local stormwater reg regulations and programs to meet the MS4 permit requirements. He's been instrumental in developing stormwater utilities for funding stormwater programs and actively participates in reviews and inspections to ensure compliance with federal, state, and local regulations. Brian's previous experience as a landscape professional has been invaluable, allowing him to integrate those skill 
skill sets into maintaining green infrastructure. So without further ado, take it away, Brian. All right, looks like I'm not muted, so that's good. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, feel free to go ahead and close out your camera. Um, I'm gonna do that here in a little bit myself so I don't distract my own picture of me. Um, unless you're eating like a big juicy burger right now over lunch, then feel free to like put your camera on and just like make my mouth water. Um, so Justin reached out to me at the Ohio Stormwater Conference to give a presentation to you guys here in Southwest Ohio, which I did work for uh, Butler Soil and Water way back in the day in the beginning of my career. So I'm very familiar with uh, Warren County in that area. Um, but a couple of years ago, I was asked to present at the Ohio Stormwater Conference, the boot camp, if any of you guys have ever attended that. And I thought a title of my presentation would be uh, the components of a successful stormwater program. That's what they wanted. But then I had the subtitle of lessons learned from 22 years of imperfection. And that's what I'm hoping to share with you guys today is uh, that you guys have the opportunity to learn from our mistakes up here in Northeast Ohio, where we have a very strong EPA uh, hold on our stormwater programs that really have pushed us to push the envelope, especially in the early 2000s and to up to about 2015 to implement a lot of this green infrastructure. Um, so a take home for you guys, hopefully I kind of paved the way for you so you don't make the same mistakes that we have as that uh, diagram you see of early adopters and late adopters, the late adopters, you know, they get the easy pathway of just learning from everyone else's mistakes. So that's kind of the idea there. Um, I believe there should be on your menu, just like a little reaction to show, just to get an idea of the crowd here. I would ask for you to put like a thumbs up or raise your hand um, if you meet one of these categories. Are you a consulting engineer that does design work? All right, nothing's popping up. So it doesn't look like we have any designers. Well, that means probably most of you guys are going to fall under this next category. If you can uh, show a thumbs up or hands up. Got a, uh, got a couple, Brian. Oh, you do? Okay, they're not yeah. showing up on mine for whatever I just, reason. I think it was John Bayer and Mihail Sivistakis. I think they're design engineers. Okay, great. Thank you for interrupting Sorry. there and letting me <laughs> Sorry know. Sorry for interrupting. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. I needed that, so I at least know the, who I'm talking to. And then a lot of, I'm assuming, are going to be reviewers. And just, just if you don't mind um, letting me know, just if there's a handful or what for that. Sure. Yep. I'm not seeing any hands right now for reviewers, but um, I think there's a couple. Um, I know there's some design engineers in here and some MS4 folks, um, administrators. Okay. That was the next group was the elected officials or administrative end of things or others, you know, the watershed and the soccer mom or whoever's just hanging out to hear me talk. But, uh, <laughs> all right. well, like I said, I'm going to go ahead and close out my um, video here and get started. Well, again, thank you guys for joining me today. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, the green infrastructure, fundamentals, and design criteria, and some maintenance insight when you're going through that whole process. And, of course, it's not letting me advance my slides. I think you'll want to click on your presentation, and then you can use your arrows to... Oh, there we go. All right. Thank you. Yep. So to give you guys a little background, Justin did a great job on that earlier, um, but mainly for the MS4 people that are out there, uh, we're responsible for uh, doing the outreach and the marketing for stormwater education, um, storm sewer outfalls and dry weather screening, construction site inspections and enforcement, post-construction inspection. So we review the water quality BMPs and inspect those after they've been installed and uh, municipal facility through pollution prevention, good housekeeping inspections. So now it's, I'm at 24 years of stormwater um, ex experience. This 
October, I'll be seven years from retirement. Looking forward to it. I'm not trying to rush my life away, but looking forward to that time. Um, I have 14 years in the landscape ex experience as a landscape professional from just maintenance stuff of trimming shrubs and trees and mowing lawns to installation of new lawns and yards and, and landscape, uh, hardscapes, patios, those sort of things. And then arborist work, uh, typical tree trimming and removal of uh, snags or dead trees. Um, most important uh, that you guys probably really care about is my personal life. Uh, I brew beer. Uh, I smoke a lot of meats. That's smoked meats, not other things. And then outdoor adventure sports, rock climbing, whitewater kayaking, uh, mountain biking, and backpacking. But with my old age, the rock climbing and the whitewater kayaking are kind of going to the wayside and now doing more of the passive recreation out there. So I do want to highlight my uh, good friend and colleague over at, at Ohio State that has a stormwater management program there, Dr. Winston. Justin brought him up earlier. He co-teaches a class with me that we'll talk about it in my last slide, but he is a huge resource here for Ohio doing a lot of amazing research. And so some of the information I borrowed from his slides in our um, course that we teach and also just information from other parts of presentations that he has done through his research. So for this presentation outline, I'm gonna give you guys an introduction of green infrastructure. I'm gonna list the common green infrastructure practices that we see mainly here in Northeast Ohio, and then uh, design criteria specifically for bioretention and porous pavements. Uh, even though I'll be covering a list of common green infrastructure projects or practices that are out there. I only have an hour. I can't bore you guys for three hours. So I eliminated the rest of those that follow and just concentrated on the two main ones that you see. So during my presentation, I'm gonna assume that you guys understand what stormwater runoff is and precipitation, uh, that you understand typical urban hydrology as we pave the earth you know, we're gonna have flashier runoff events because it's no longer able to soak into the ground. Uh, that you know, typical stormwater pollutions, nutrients, heavy metals, that kind of stuff, and their sources that they come from. Because I'm not gonna cover any of that stuff in this presentation. And you have basic stormwater management uh, concepts. We need to control flood control and water quality. So what is green infrastructure? When I Googled this, US EPA actually had two, um, two definitions that were available. So it's a collection of measures that use plants and soil systems, permeable surfaces and landscapes to manage stormwater, and an approach to wet weather management that is cost-effective, sustainable, and environmentally friendly. So the basic concepts of both of those definitions are, are the same. It is using plant-based and soil systems or other type of practices that allow infiltration um, to manage water quality specifically. And at the same time, it's sustainable, it's cost-effective, environmentally friendly. What we found is short-term green infrastructure is not very cost-effective. Um, in the long-term compared to typical basins that you see or underground systems, um, it is very cost effective when you're looking at it long term versus short term. Dredging costs for a typical basin is very expensive and 20 years out when you have to dredge a pond, especially if you didn't design to be able to spread that material there on site. The cost of diesel fuel, well, maybe not right now, but historically has gone up a lot in the last decade and having to haul that material somewhere to a landfill or another location is the expensive part of that. So where and how can we use green infrastructure? A lot of times you could just put it in proposed landscapes. There's zoning requirements uh, to have open space around the perimeters or in parking lot islands. Green infrastructure is a great place to put in there, specifically bioretention cells or infiltration trenches. Up on your rooftops, uh, use, utilizing a green roof, there's opportunities there, and especially in new development or new sites, parking lots. Um, 
open space areas in general and in our road right of ways. So if you're a community, there's a, plenty of opportunities to put green infrastructure within roundabouts or within the road right of ways as we're performing um, upgrades. But the basic idea is to mimic uh, nature and our natural stormwater sinks to slow water down, allow some infiltration, evapotranspiration to occur, and uh, to reduce that stormwater runoff. So here's a picture of a stormwater pond. It's a wetland system that's up near Cleveland in the city of Parma. And um, basically, you know, we, in, in nature's landscape, we have these little pockets of wetlands that hold water naturally. And that's what we're trying to mimic here. One of the definitions, the second one from the US EPA was looking at these three criteria: environmental, economic, and social impacts. That's what they call the triple bottom line. So when you look at gray infrastructure in general, they may provide some environmental benefit like a wet pond that's extended detention or a dry pond with extended detention that provides some water quality treatment. There's some benefit to that. There may be some economic benefit of you know, the cost to install those BMPs are cheaper. But when you look at social impacts, unless people are able to recreate on a wet pond, they really don't provide much. Where a lot of things like this bioretention cell that's in the photo here, and it's providing um, environmental benefit through filtering BMP, so it's performing better. Uh, it's designed with an internal water storage to allow more infiltration and recharging our groundwater system here, um, utilizing plants that provide habitat and aesthetic values. Um, economically, we're reducing our stormwater runoff, so that's a benefit to our, it's not taxing our stormwater system or MS4 system as much. And then social impacts, just having landscape and that aesthetics does help, you know, your mind, property values, those sort of things. But ultimately, you can't just go gray, you just can't go green. Uh, you need to utilize uh, both. So the first practice I'm gonna talk about is bioretention cell, which Justin had a nice picture of, um, I believe it was in Lebanon, he said, that was just installed through that grant. So if you're not familiar with bioretention cells, they're basically just a shallow concave uh, bowl that has a soil media filter that's located in it. It's a plant-based system where you really rely on the soil food web or the soil community and the plants to remove pollution uh, from stormwater runoff. It reduces uh, runoff by quite a bit, but it's about 40% is a lot of what um, Ohio State's research has shown. Even in, up in Northwest Ohio, where you have the old lake plains, with tight clays, they have been able to reduce stormwater runoff in the 20% area. It relies on the soil microbial community. So all those microbes in the soil to break down pollutants, uh, to keep that mac macropores and micropores active in that soil. A plant-based community too, uh, through uptake of nutrients, evapotranspiration, pulling that stored water in that soil media and uh, putting that back into the atmosphere. Designing characteristics to function, uh, remove pollutants and self-maintain. So a lot of these plants that are selected for bioretention, specifically not these flowering um, lilies that are in there, but the switchgrass that's in the middle of that bioretention cell, those have extensive root systems that go back or down about anywhere from five to eight feet deep. Um, break up the soil through what we call root turnover every winter. That root mass will die back about 30% and then reestablish itself and grow again. So it keeps that mac macro pore and the pathways open, adding organic matter to that soil. You design them with an internal water storage, which is basically the under drain that's located in, in the system is raised, or you put an upturned elbow into that design of the under drain. It allows water to store in the gravel base where uh, it can't, creates an anaerobic condition and there's an anaerobic bacteria that will remove nitrogen, basically take nitrogen and turn it into a nitrogen gas, 
and reduce the nutrient uh, loading from that. So typical bioretention cell removes about 40% nitrogen, but by doing that internal water storage, you're looking at 90% removal rates. Requires some gray infrastructure, uh, catch basins, high flow bypasses, pipes, that sort of thing. Um, the benefits provides our ecosystem services. So habitat for pollinators and, and um, other type of beneficial insects. You can use it to meet your landscape requirements through shrubs and trees being planted into these systems and count towards your open space. Provides aesthetic value, especially when there's wildflowers and flowering like dogwoods and things like that that are planted in them. They're very high performing. They remove a lot of pollutants, which we'll talk about in a little bit, especially compared to a lot of the other practices that are out there. You can reduce your runoff and uh, treat temperature control. Up here in Northeast Ohio, we have a lot of steelhead streams that drain directly into Lake Erie. So it is critical for us to reduce our stormwater runoff temperature uh, try to get it close to that 55 degrees of groundwater um, to feed our streams. Because if we have hot water discharging into our cold water streams that support that fishing industry, then your dissolved oxygen drops and the temperature rises, causing that dissolved oxygen to drop and kill off um, the fishing industry that, that's very prevalent here in Northeast Ohio. Uh, limitations, it's limited to small watersheds, and if there are perched water tables where you have uh, lateral movement of the groundwater and shallow depths, uh, that could be an issue for, for the bioretention cells. So here's a diagram of a bioretention cell. Um, you can see where the trees and the flowers are, that is your ponding area. So that area needs to drain within 24 hours per the permit. A lot of times they're dra it drains within three to five hours is typically what we find if they're installed and the proper material is used. And then in the next layer, you have the soil filtering media and planting mix there. That is about three feet. I believe the rainwater manual says 24 inches to 36 inches. So, um, Often we see them designed for 24 inches. That's the maximum or the most expensive part of a bioretention cell, Specialized purchasing that specialized soil mix. It's about $45 a yard up here. Last time I checked versus, you know, gravel and clean concrete sand and the pea gravel, the other layers that are there. As I mentioned, an internal water storage. So we automatically default all designs to be designed in a bioretention cell with internal water storage. That can be done through having the underdrain located at this height, going to a catch basin or outletting out, or as a, this diagram shows, an upturn elbow, and then uh, creating that saturation zone through here. And here it says gravel six to eight inches, but typically we see about 12 inches of gravel in our designs. So how does a bioretention work? When it rains, we get the precipitation, the runoff from whatever catchment area that we are treating. If it's a really large rain event. You have a high flow bypass, which is usually a Q2 catch basin designed to allow that overflow. But we have a water quality volume that is stored within a bioretention cell. Often it's about 12 inches. Through that, you have water going through the soil media, going out the under drain, out the outlet structure and discharging, but you do have some evapotranspiration and um, infiltration that occurs. As for pollutants throughout the system, most of it is caught right here at the surface. As you see pathogens, oil and grease, heavy metals, TSS, meaning suspended solids there, phosphorus, a lot of that is trapped right at the surface. And then nitrogen and um, temperature controlled lower, as we talked about in that turn of water storage. So if you just simply take this under drain, raise it up a foot and create a foot of uh, storage area through here, you allow the water to sit a little bit longer in the bottom of that re uh, bioretention cell to lower that temperature before the next stormwater discharge. So where are the pollutants trapped in this? Ohio State, 
uh, they did research on mature or older bioretention cells, 10 years up to 20 years old. Um, they worked with, a, it was a co-project with a university in Sweden, which I worked with Dr. Winston and his team to go to a bunch of bioretention cells here in Northeast Ohio and a few here in Summit County specifically. They basically did core samples where the inlet was located of, of the cell to the midpoint and then towards the outlet structure. And they did three different sampling depths, like three to four inches, and then halfway down that bioretention cell and then about uh, 24 inches. And what they found was majority of the pollutants are removed in the top three to four inches of the filter media. As that diagram before showed, a lot of that stuff is trapped there. Um, and then it wasn't just like uh, nutrients and heavy metals and polyaromatic hydrocarbons, like the old traditional pollutants we were worried about but microplastics and PFAS were also identified being trapped there. As you went deeper down in the cell, there was less of that. So obviously these BMPs are working and not discharging these pollutants through the system. They also found that with age, it's just like a fine wine, it gets better, they function better than early younger systems that may be a year or five years older. And that's mainly because of the bioactivity that occurs within the soil itself through the plant root systems that I discussed earlier and that root turnover and the biology that lives in the rhizomes, fear, the rhizosphere and in that area of the plants uh, are breaking down these nutrients and, and pollutions. Maintaining those uh, macropores to allow stormwater to run through these systems. So the next stormwater control measure is permeable pavement, or R, since it's uh, multiple systems. It could be concrete, asphalt, uh, pavers, and then the grid system. These are limited due to impervious or pervious ratio. So the picture here on the right shows the parking stalls with the porous concrete or asphalt. I don't remember specifically which one that is, um, but there's an impervious area that's draining towards this or within the watershed or catchment area. Um, so there's a traditional asphalt that, that drains into the system. Reduces stormwater runoff in volume. So it allows it to perme permeate through this layer of this permeable pavement and enter a gravel bed that's below where there you can design it with this internal water storage, just like you do a bioretention cell to allow additional infiltration to occur in uh, nitrogen removal or you can maintain that uh, under drain, you know, three, four inches from the subsoils and um, allowed to be designed without that internal storage. It relies on filtering the sediment here on the surface. So specifically, if you follow my mouse, you could see a rack line of organic debris that came. So the water is obviously soaking through to this point and getting to this location here as it's running off if you saw this during a rain event. Um, so it's designed to trap sediment and debris here at the surface. So it, it's, it's basically a screen, right? It should be designed with high flow bypasses. So I would not recommend putting in a porous pavement parking lot without catch basins or uh, catch basins in the curb area or having a curb cut or something that allows larger rain events or if the system was to fail to have bypassing. Requires some gray infrastructure, like I said, catch basins and pipes and under drains, but also some type of curb system or, or, or ribbon curbs like you can see here on the left of the pore section where my mouse is moving uh, to, to maintain that structure so you don't get sprawling and other things that occur. So one nice thing is that this, utilizing this BMP doesn't require additional space. If you're designing a site, let's say a box, big box retail or a small commercial site, you're already going to install parking. So um, to utilize this doesn't require any additional space versus like a traditional stormwater pond 
we're maybe going to have to take up a half acre or a quarter acre or a full acre, depending on the size of the site and eat up uh, space on that site. As I mentioned, you could design it with internal water storage to increase that denitrification and storing that uh, water in a saturation zone and allow for more infiltration. You can reduce gray infrastructure because basically this whole site is working kind of like a catch basin. So maybe you're, you don't need to put in as many uh, catch basins and storm sewers into the system. And it can be utilized with rainwater harvests with other BMPs like rainwater harvesting or um, cisterns. They did a site like that up in Perkins Township up in Erie County where they have porous concrete it goes through and then it's stored into a underground storage system where they can use it for irrigation. Limits would be related to land use. Maybe there's an, a land use that utilizes a lot of trucking and uh, heavy trailers. So it may not be the proper system for that. Maybe you're only using it in the employee parking versus where there are a lot of big semi-trucks or something that's heavy and storing uh, to avoid those areas. If there's a slope on the site, obviously uh, porous pavement on an entrance where there might be a four or 5% grade may not be the quite the right selection uh, to use a BMP there such as porous pavements, especially pavers, um, because all the water to do is soak in and then seek out in another area. And then upslope areas, making sure it's a stable watershed. We'll talk about trees and up, upslope areas like this landscape bed here on the right of that picture where mulch may wash into the system and cause premature clogging. So here's a diagram of, uh, of concrete pavers or any, you could just change that out with concrete, porous concrete, asphalt, or anything else. But you have your porous material here on top. You have your subgrading here with a under drain. So that's a typical design that you're gonna find for these BMPs. So how should this work? Basically newly installed pavements to have an infiltration rate of 500 to 1,000 inches per hour. So as you see in this picture, the fire truck spraying a full open hose onto the porous pavement and it's just soaking in. That's how they should work if it's installed correctly. Go back here a second. So you can see it's just infiltrating right through there as that uh, water just kind of rains onto that surface. Green roofs, they're not very common. Um, you know, there's a handful here in Summit County and probably like two dozen in Northeast Ohio that I'm aware of, but they rely on a soil media with a plant on, on top of a structurally supported rooftop. Basically it's only treating the clean water, what's falling on a roof and that is rainwater, which is a lot cleaner than water coming off of our parking lots and lawns. The soil media that's used in these systems consists of a highly organic matter and expanded shale. So if anyone's familiar with expanded shale, they use it a lot of times in those concrete walls that you see uh, on, on large warehouses that are being trucked in. Um, it's a very light material and that's what they use here uh, um, for the soil media on green roofs. Requires some gray infrastructure, so uh, roof drains for those high flow bypasses, uh, the barrier layers, and um, obviously a, a, root that, a roof that can support that kind of weight because you're looking at water and soil medias. So it does provide benefits, um, provides especially highly urbanized areas, uh, ecosystem services, so some greenscape, some plants for wildlife out there. They reduce, they're mainly a lot of the benefits of a green roof aren't stormwater related. To reduce urban heat aisle effect or heating of the building, so it can help reduce heating and cooling costs. Uh, green roofs in Germany have shown to extend the life of the roof to 80 years, typical there. Um, 
they actually function better in cooler climates. So something like Ohio from Cincinnati to Cleveland are great climates for these type of systems. Chicago has over something like 700 million um, oh man, square feet of green roofs and they utilize them a lot there and they thrive in that um, environment. Limitations are green roofs are known to export phosphorus. So if you are in a watershed where phosphorus is an issue, I do not recommend utilizing green roofs because of that high organic matter to hold some of that water there uh, for the plant systems. Um, it's known to help uh, to cause exporting phosphorus. Other limitations, uh, roof structures. So especially if you're looking to do a retrofit, obviously you need a structural engineer to look at it and it needs to be able to support a green roof. Hot climates. So the cooler and the further you go north, the better they work. Then, um, so basically something in Toronto, they're gonna, these are gonna function better in Toronto than they are down in Nashville. So basically green roofs have a soil media with the vegetation and that expanded shale with the organic matter. Then you have some type of geo textile to hold that in place. And then you have different layers to ensure the roots don't go down any further. Um, and then protection layers for functioning, puncture, puncturing and, um, and then waterproof membrane and then the roof structure itself. So extensive roofs are shallow soil-based systems. They are roughly about four inches of soil. They are mainly made up of these sedum plants. They grow outward or creep versus upward. They may only grow about eight inches high, but like I said, they mainly creep outward uh, to grow. Extensive roofs are also gonna have these modular trays systems where they're grown, these trays are grown in a greenhouse and um, then moved to be placed on the rooftop. A lot of times they have little risers on them that they sit on. So once the water fills up, they seep, seep or go over the tray system and then travel under the tray system to roof drains. And then this is a green roof up in the Cleveland area that's intensive, which is greater than six inches of soil. I believe this is on like the third floor of this uh, structure here. And you see they have trees growing and shrubs. So this is requiring a much deeper root system or soil system to be able to manage those roots. Um, typically these do not have that expanded, sh ex expanded shale. They have more of your typical topsoil and planting soil that you see in, in traditional landscape. Additionally, the areas with the Adirondack chairs back there, um, that is turf grass, but it also has um, typical soil there. Um, is also a functioning green roof. So this is just a nice place for employees to take a break or go out to at lunch. Uh, provides a lot of value in that aspect. Constructed wetlands is another uh, GI practice. Basically, it's a basin, right? Everyone pretty much knows how to design a basin. We've been doing that for since the 70s. Um, so overall, it's a lot easier to design. Um, it can manage larger and small watersheds. Requires some gray infrastructure, just like a typical basin, that outlet structure or a concrete weir and pipes. Provides a lot more benefits than your typical wet pond or dry pond because it provides habitat and ecosystem services, remo removes more pollution than typical basins due to the shallow areas of a wetland that allows the plants to uptake nutrients, slow the water down to allow more sediment to drop out. Limitations are soils. Most of us here in Ohio don't have A and B soils, um, or if we do, they're in, in small areas. 
but uh, you know, C and D soils are typically what we find here in Ohio. And so constructed wetlands are perfect for those scenarios. Invasive plants managing up here in Ohio or Northeast Ohio, we have Phragmites is a big problem, um, but purple loosestrife, um, narrow leaf cattails and other wetland invasive species will move into these systems. So if they're not controlled, then uh, they will kill off all the plants that were intended to be placed there due to overcrowding. And then at that point you have vector issues because they provide greater habitat for mosquitoes. Um, where if you can control those, the native habitat will provide um, beneficial insects to eat those, such as dragonflies and dragonfly larvae. Uh, the, the public perspective of wetlands, it's a bad term. People think, you know, mosquitoes and, and other pests. So there is that whole outreach and perspective that and idea that we have to change. So that that's a limitation to these. And then costs compared to other basins, it is going to be more expensive because of the cost of plants. So just like a basin, you're gonna have your inlet, which this diagram shows coming in on the left, and then stormwater traveling through low flow channels or shallow air, shallow areas that are deeper than the rest of it. You're gonna have your upland areas that kind of steer the water through a longer bypass or a longer pathway. And then you're gonna have your flood areas that would kind of function as a floodplain. Just kind of cross-sectional area to show that. Um, I do wanna say if you are a designer, please put four bays in any basin you have. Dry basins or wet ponds, it's so much easier to maintain a small little four bay and to dip that out every five years than it is to go through and remove all that sediment accumulation throughout the rest of the basin. So wetlands, they function through removing sedimentation, um, collecting trash and solids and those sort of things. As I mentioned, it increases biodiversity. Some of them do support fish. Uh, you have those shallow pool or deeper pool areas within the wetland that allow fish to survive. And because of the vegetation, you just dissipate the energy. Infiltration basins and trenches, these are not common BMPs. We have, I think, like six of them here in Summit County. Um, they're in what we have shyly soil, we call it. Uh, it's sand and gravel outwash from the glaciers. And it has inf infiltration or KSAT type uh, bottles of water migrate through about six to 20 inches per hour. Um, so these are where bioretention cells or infiltration basins are utilized here in Summit County. Um, if it's a trench, it's just a narrow trench that's filled with gravel uh, and allows the water just to infiltrate through. There may be an underdrain uh, to help dewater some of that system that's set high, just like an internal water storage that goes to a 2-2 catch basin um, for high flow bypasses and where the outlet pipe would be. Basins, as shown in this picture, have a shallow bottom, a lot of more surface area to allow for infiltration. The water quality volume on either one of these BMPs need to be drained within 24 hours. Um, the benefits of infiltration basins are reducing your stormwater runoff through in increasing infiltration, pollutant removal through that infiltration, allowing that to go through the soil media, temperature control because we're allowing all that infiltration to occur. And then those base flows are going eventually to streams or wetlands. And, uh, peak flow infiltration. So this is, as I mentioned on Shiloh soil, we have here in Summit County critical storm. And so this is a hundred year critical storm that they had to infiltrate. So this BMP is infiltrating a hundred year storm and has a high flow bypass for anything that's larger than a hundred year storm. As I mentioned, limitations for infiltration basins or soils, you need that highly permeable soil with high KSAT rates, um, 
pre-treatment. So we want to remove any pollutants that are going in or sediment that's going into this so we don't clog an infiltration layer. Uh, we don't want compaction during installation or during construction process. So making sure they stay out of that infiltration bed or the bottom of it and are excavating through the outside. And just in general maintenance, uh, removing any clog or clogging layers. So here's a cross section of an infiltration basin where you have your ponding depths. And then uh, we utilize a lot of ASTM C33 clean concrete sand six inch layer here, just because this undisturbed and sits through soil is highly um, permeable. So we're trying to use six in the six inch to slow it down a little bit, which probably has like a two to six inch uh, infiltration rate, you know, per hour um, and allow some of those pollutants to be trapped in that area. So it's not going through and contaminating uh, the groundwater table. With all BMPs provide a high flow bypass. So always allow a system once it's full to allow it to pass um, to go downstream. Here's a situation with a bioretention cell. This is a turf bioretention cell where they provide a high flow bypass. In this situation here on the left, this is porous asphalt that they did not. There's just no catch basin or anything. So if you imagine you were parked here with your car, you have this big ponding area during a rain event. Um, it is not infiltrating. The porous asphalt here is clogged and not infiltrating as fast as it should be, that 500 plus inches per hour. And so there is no high flow bypass or catch basin there to allow it to drain in those situations. So please install those. So the first BMP we're gonna get into here in the details is bioretention cell and give you guys some design considerations. Specifically in this photo right here, the stormwater would come uh, from the left, enter this little gravel diaphragm, and then across this grass filter strip into the bioretention cell that's loaded here with trees and native plantings of wildflowers and grasses. The ponding area is located about this height. Before we go through a flat high flow bypass, it's located here at the end, and then it will infiltrate into that soil media to be filtered. So, like I said, I hope you guys learned from our past mistakes. Uh, some of our previous bioretention cells, you can see here's a pipe that's discharging right into a bioretention cell. There's no forebay or anything here to trap the sediment. So it's all discharging through um, to this large bioretention cell. And uh, you can see that there's sediment accumulating uh, in this area. So bioretention cells work as a functioning media or a filtering media. So we are filtering all this sediment here at the surface. Where simply we designed a four bay, um, a lot of that would be trapped here, and then we simply just dip that to remove the sediment once it reaches fifty percent storage volume loss, and um, we extend that life of these filter areas here. Picture here on the right: some water is coming off of the parking lot, uh, going right to this BMP. What are multiple issues here? Are uh, we have we don't have pretreatment, and then the outlet structure is right here at the inlet. So we're, even though this is filling up, you could tell by the rack line in this area, um, it's gonna fill up from this area as it's coming in first and bypass a lot of the dirty water. So by simply moving this catch basin over to one end here um, and forcing it to travel this length, we would remove a lot more sediment. Here's some more examples of Bioretention cells being installed in the city of Indianapolis. They are wonderful about doing green streets programs. Uh, the problem here is there's really not much pretreatment. So you can see all the debris getting caught um, here at the entrance. So if we're not providing a four bay or a filter strip or other pretreatment uh, practices out there, you know, we're going to, have to come in and maintain this area a lot more often to make sure this isn't coming in and clogging our systems. As I kind of described area, earlier, pretreatment through a filter strip, where stormwater runoffs coming through and filtering through turf grass, we're going to remove about 50% of the sediment right there. Other pretreatment designs, a lot of times we see curb cuts with uh, gravel. 
located here. Ultimately, what happens is it does fill up with sediment, and then you end up getting grass to grow. So you might as well just plant grass here to begin with. Um, and turf grass is going to provide a lot more sediment removal than the gravel itself. If you go ahead and do design it, we, when we're going out and looking at these, inspecting them for maintenance, we don't comment on removing the grass and digging out the gravel and replacing it just because it's filtering a BMP. Now, if it starts backing up and you see sediment building up here, then there's a sign that we need to scrape that to allow stormwater to flow through these systems and continue into the filter media. Other pretreatment concepts are uh, a porous pavement system. So this picture on the left has porous asphalt. So you have uh, impervious asphalt running onto porous. That's doing a lot of sediment removal. And then it runs into a bioretention cell from there. In this situation, they're using porous pavers um, where it comes through and then enters a curb cut here to enter the bioretention system here. There is a company, Rain Guardian. I'm not endorsing anyone, but they make a great product to provide pretreatment and simple sediment removal solutions. Um, this one, I believe, is called either the Foxhole or Bunker. Stormwater runoffs goes through this grate. Sediment and solids are trapped either here at the surface or down here. When you simply remove the grate, you get a shovel and just clean that out. And then it enters the bioretention system there. This is the turret. So stormwater comes through, again, the big uh, solids are caught up top, sediments trapped below. You can easily remove this grate, go in with a vector truck with a hose or a shovel to clean that out. Also, what's nice about these, uh, you don't have like the steep side slopes where erosion can occur. Um, it allows it to drop into this slight sump area, and then you just place some gravel here for uh, dispersed energy. As I mentioned earlier, the flow path of a bioretention cell is very critical. Uh, the picture here on the left is a turf bioretention cell with some river birch. They have inlet, three inlets coming into here. Uh, the outlet structure is located here in this berm. Um, so majority of the stormwater has to flow through the system before it discharges. This so one here on the right, you can see the inlet at this uh, corner of the curbs. That discharges right to this, towards the outlet where you see short circuiting. You can see the ponding area through this bioretention cell located at that elevation. So there is another inlet over here, but a majority of the site and the pitch of the pavement is going to this uh, curb cut discharging sediment, turbid water uh, through the high flow bypass. Other uh, Bypass design considerations. Pretty much all contractors have two two catch basins located on, in their stockyard, so we always recommend two two catch basins for high flow bypass. Um, they're easy to get versus uh, you know a pipe with with a grate on top of it. These may be cheaper, but something that's twenty four inches versus something that's 12, or we even seen some that are eight inches and they put in several high flow bypasses. It's just more simple to put in one simple catch, you know, two, two catch basin that engineers know how much water flows through those based on a catchment area and how much can handle. So other high flow bypass or an outlet structure designs to consider are the beehives. Simply putting in a beehive does allow a little more safety factor um, compared to the system here on the left where this flat grate can easily clog and um, prevent the flow from this. That can cause issues of either ponding water in the parking lot or wherever the lowest point of discharge would be um, where the water's not intended to go to those areas. Um, these aren't clogless, the, the beehive systems, they, uh, but there's less chance of it clogging fully. Um, it would require major neglect uh, for those to clog. So as my brother-in-law, when we were sitting around his uh, smokeless fire pit 
one Christmas day outside and it was producing a lot of smoke and we were just saying, I thought these were smokeless. And he said, looked at me and said, Brian, these are smoke less, not smokeless. And so just like these outlets, these clog less, they aren't clogless. So they still require maintenance and clearing, but uh, less likely to clog. Mulching considerations. So the picture here on the, sorry, on the left, the designer used a stone mulch. So they had to, mulch is like the most expensive maintenance portion of bioretention cells. Going in and replacing that material. So they had one with a stone bioretention cell. Eventually they did put plants in here. But if you imagine these are filtering BMPs and sediments trapping on the top, you can imagine trying to remove the gravel to remove the top four inches of the filter media um, to remove that sediment versus the system here on the right is a plant more of a plant-based system you have your mulch someone can easily come in here scrape that mulch off and then replace it since a lot of that sediment's going to be trapped on that top of that mulch layer so to maintain is a lot easier um, yes there is cost related to to mulching but this bioretention cell could actually place more plants in here to help reduce the amount of area to be mulched when it's planting a bioretention cell, we've had a lot of success with turf bioretention cells using uh, turf type tall fescue. And um, a lot of times people don't like the wild woolly look of the filtering system of a bioretention cell. So this turf does give it a more manicured look. Um, this has been one that's been installed about 12 years. Uh, it's functioning great. You, we are starting to see a little bit of standing water at the inlets, but uh, that's just simply go and remove, replace the turf and reseed it and straw it and, or even using a sod in that area may be fine. Um, but what's gonna function the best and require the least amount of maintenance are utilizing our native wildflowers and grasses and trees. Um, it's gonna provide a lot more habitat um, keep those macropores open more, remove a lot more pollutants, that sort of thing. When it comes to the side slopes of bioretention cells, we really promote utilizing sod on the side. So you get an immediate uh, filtering um, uh, of stormwater uh, as it's the rest of the site stabilizing versus if you just seed and and strud, you're going to get a lot of sediment washing through and erosion uh, gullies forming here and all that washing into your bioretention cell. So a lot of times we uh, encourage the use of sod to be placed along the side slopes. Picture on the left here, they did use a lot of sod, but they did a portion of it have landscape. Imagine if this was all mulch all the way down, then you end up with, with this erosion and reeling that occurs that would be entering your system causing premature clogging. Cleanouts for the under drains, especially of internal water stores. A picture here on the left. Uh, this is actually in Portage County, a neighboring county. Uh, they do not provide a, a clean out with, with the under drain. So how do you go in and clean this if you have an upturned elbow? How do you, you know, remove any of the clogging in there? Um, so clean outs are highly recommended. You do not have to leave it this high, uh, so it's not an ugly thing. You can put it on the surface and then uh, have a removable cap or something like that that can be placed there. Porous pavements. Next conversation. So um, if you're not too familiar with porous pavement or pavers, these are two pavers here in this photo. But the treatment uh, uh, or the trapping is basically like this is working like a screen. We are trapping all the solids here at the surface of um, any type of porous pavement system. So you can see mulch and other cigarette butts and things trapped here on the picture on the left versus the picture here on the right. A lot of that is just sediment that's cut there, trapped. So when uh, we're gonna talk about design issues, starting with uh, asphalt. What we found here in Northeast Ohio, a lot of our systems that we installed 
Then in like 2010, um, we have raveling. So all this kind of rice crispy surface, imagine the surface just the rice krispies falling off and you get like a gravel, loose gravel uh, for formation here, especially where you get a lot of traffic uh, wear and tear, um, like the weight of the engine with the tires, the car braking, coming into a parking stall. And then a lot of times people are turning their wheels as they're backing out. So that's wearing that down and breaking that material off. So raveling issues, as you can see in these photos in close up, a lot of that, that uh, aggregate is breaking loose and washing off into the stormwater uh, curb and gutter and then discharging into your high flow bypass. What we found um, was a lot of our issues with porous asphalt was use, using a typical binder that we use in asphalt. And as that surface area heats up, we were getting binder drain that would occur. So it would drop deeper into that porous asphalt system. And then where it would hit cooler temperatures and solidify and kind of create an area that would uh, prevent, could eventually stop water from filtrating into the system is one big issue. And the other is now there's nothing binding that aggregate at the surface and that's what wears off. So um, Dr. Winston says asphalt binders use a PG76-22 with fiber reinforcement and that would prevent that uh, heating and binder drain that occurs um, in our past installations. We have pretty much moved away from porous asphalt because of our issues in the back in the past. So we haven't tried this yet, but we'll see if there's any success in the future if we go this route. Concrete, we get the same thing, a lot of raveling issues. You could see here the picture on the left, all that aggregate is washing to the curb. And then you get, uh, you can see it here in the picture in the hand. So this is often caused by improper mixing of the concrete supplier or green plastic curing. Those are the two issues that were found um, with Dr. Ryan's research or Dr. Ryan Winston's research. So simply just removing this with a street sweeper, you know, a regenerative system where you could sock that up with the brushes in the back part of it. Um, it doesn't infect the infiltration rate. It just looks bad as people are walking up, um, that sort of thing. So when it comes to designing pervious asphalt, you want to think about, especially if you have a impervious surface area draining to a pervious surface area, what that ratio is. So I believe the rainwater manual says nothing more to a uh, one-to-one -one ratio. So if you got 10,000 square feet of um, porous asphalt or concrete or pavers, it's going to be 10,000 square feet of traditional paving systems here. Uh, where you find is uh, a lot of the clogging occurs more at the interface. So the impervious, pervious interface there, because the water is going to be running off and all of a sudden it's going to be, you know, getting trapped and clogged in the system here. But if you have a parking lot where the picture on the right, where it's all entirely a paver system, then whatever falls on it is just where the water is draining. So it's not going to clog as often because we don't have that impervious area of dirty water catchment area draining towards this. Design consideration and location of using this. So the picture on the left is on um, basically street parking. Uh, they went with a really thick paver system that has like six inches thick to handle heavy loads. You can't tell here, but here the truck on the right that was just using this parking lane as a lane to drive down. This is a semi truck. It's a heavy industrial area. So they made the right choice of the paver system to use in this specific case. Here on the right, it's kind of an emergency access area that doesn't get used very often. So they went with that concrete grid system. Um, it's a lot cheaper, a lot easier. You know, it's not really there to design to treat 
don't want to run onto it, it's just there for whatever rain falls onto it. So um, that's a great product to pick for that location. One other design location is uh, this is specifically a car dealership where we have a run or impervious area running onto an impervious area running onto a pervious area. So you think about car dealerships and their stock of cars. So to come in here and perform maintenance to run a street sweeper or something like that is going to be nearly impossible because the cars are just going to be sitting um, in this area. So how are you going to perform maintenance? That's something to think about um, when you're designing porous pavement systems in their location. It's going to require someone to move all this car, all the cars uh, for a street sweeper to come in here and perform maintenance. So other design considerations are related to traffic and turning in a parking lot area. So if you're going to have a lot of uh, maybe the Pepsi truck running through to go fill a vending machine, um, you know, we're going to want a stronger system here, traditional concrete or asphalt versus the porous pavement. Um, where there's a lot of vehicle turning, maybe when they're following the drive aisles and then turning in to go to another one, um, where the wheels are turning, that would help with the integrity. So you would go with the traditional, you know, paving system there. Uh, as I mentioned before, where cars are parked in the stall and turning their tires to back out, you get a lot of wear and tear in that area. So maybe just going with slanted parking may help reduce some of that wear and tear. Thinking about trees, and uh, there's a high correlation of trees, tree canopy and leaves clogging porous pavements. For maintenance, this is an easy thing. You just go out with a leaf blower, blow it out of there, but you're gonna have to go out there for like once a week. And as the cars drive on this area and the wheels and tires grind that material in, you are gonna clog uh, that material here at the surface. Other considerations is snow storage. Um, up here in Northeast Ohio, we have Lake Erie, which is a wonderful resource and attribute to us, but it also dumps a lot of snow on us here in Northeast Ohio. Case in point, I think Geauga County gets about 80 inches a year. Um, so it's a lot of snow and a lot of road aggregate and debris and things in the snow as you could easily identify as the large snow storage banks, you know, are starting to melt away and see all that grit and stuff that's there. So we do not want that draining towards our um, porous pavement systems. So, you know, designing that so it drains maybe to a bioretention cell or to a different BMP and isn't draining towards our porous pavement or being stored on such like a BMP where it's going to clog it. Speed bumps, so especially with pavers, as you have traffic like the picture here on the left, hits a speed bump, and if it's heavier loads, again, those vending trucks delivering all the sodas to the vending machines and things, it bounces and then the weight hits that and causes sump areas and uh, basically, basically sump, sumps and sunken in areas. By not doing ribbon curbs, you have structural issues so here you have traditional asphalt, which is a flexible pavement with your pavers that would require a curbing ribbon in that place. The one on the right is a simple, just pedestrian pathway with a plastic curb or, or liner. And you can tell it's shifting and it's causing structural failure there. Maintenance for the uh, Grid systems just simply requires a brush sweeper just coming in and brushing, running it over and brushing that up and then just going in with your rake and re-raking that in. That's all you need to do is restore the infiltration capacity of a grid system. When it comes to porous asphalt, uh, just routine, maybe once or twice a year, running a regenerative street sweeper over it is enough to do uh, routine maintenance. If you're doing that twice a year, you probably don't have to do restorative maintenance unless for some reason there's something catastrophic like sediment from a construction site next door or from uphill area, like, 
came down during a large rain event and clogged it. Uh, otherwise, uh, successful uh, restorative maintenance that Ohio State has shown to work is milling payment or uh, pressure washing. Porous concrete uh, is pretty much the same as um, porous asphalt for routine maintenance. You just utilize a regenerative street sweeper, go through once or twice a year. Uh, major failure issues or clogging issues then would require uh, restorative maintenance of a vector truck or vacuum truck to be used at a higher sucking RPM vol volumes or um, pressure washing. Horse pavers, routine maintenance is a regenerative street sweeper, restorative, you have to come in and really suck that three quarters of an inch of a material out with the factor trucks. Uh, pressure washing does work, but you're just gonna be blowing all the aggregate out. So you might as well just use the factor truck system. Uh, cost of prohibiting portion of pavers is you have these uh, chimneys or channels for the water to flow through because the paver itself is impervious and it's the border of the paver that does allow for infiltration. And so you got to replace that material because we want that clogging to occur at the surface, correct? And not deeper down in the system. There's a product called a pave drain that is a great concept. And we see it used a lot here in the city of Akron. But here on the left, if you follow my mouse, it's the system that I was talking about that's like six inches deep. So water hits it. There's no choker material used in these joints. So the water just goes right into it to the sub base material. And then it does provide an arc for additional stormwater storage in that. So here are the picture in the center with the with the blocks numbered. You can see that there is no choker stone placed into that. What, what did I mention? Where do we move the sediment on these systems? Or at the surface, correct? So any other type of paver system, we are stopping that sediment and clogging it here. So what happens if we get sediment, it's gonna, if we go back to the picture on the right, it's gonna seek through those chimneys, eventually clog that and sediment's gonna build up. So the picture here on the right where my mouse is now, you can see that those whole channels or chimney areas are completely clogged with sediment. So it is not providing any infiltration allowed or is happening here. So the picture center bottom is a, just a two by four cut in four pieces with some uh, plumber putty put onto it. And then you step on it and you create a seal and you pour a bucket of water in there. It is not draining. So these channels are completely clogged and is not functioning. So you could run a street sweeper in this. All you want is probably not gonna clean it out. Uh, the next test would probably be a vector truck on very high volumes to see if it sucks it out. Otherwise you have to remove these uh, bricks and then replace them. And that sounds super expensive to me. So this system here, we were getting a lot of push from their sales rep. And as I said, we've seen several fails, um, failures with that system itself. So I know we're running late, but uh, I just want to bring home some take homes. Green infrastructures provide a lot more benefits than just typical gray systems. Well, just like all things in life, right? Uh, the pendulum swings. And in the 90s, 80s and 90s, we're all about gray. 2000 to the mid 2015 ish area, we were all about green. Um, what we found is green is not, green alone is not the answers. We had a lot of failures with that. So we do have to do a hybrid of gray and green infrastructure. When you're designing it, just think how the practices treat stormwater BMPs. So if it's a filtering BMP, making sure we have good pretreatment. If it's like a pond that's holding water, um, then how does that work? Um, if it's porous pavement, think about how it's a screening type system. And so you're always thinking about how it's treating BMPs as you're designing it. So with screen system, obviously we don't wanna put dirty snow storage on top of like something that's gonna clog at the surface. 
consider and plan for maintenance during the design phase. Um, a lot of times we don't have access for heavy equipment to get into our basins. So by providing a simple lane to be able to, or drive access to get there, um, to be able to access these BMPs, uh, that sort of thing, always consider about maintenance while you're doing the design or the review for that matter and provide comments to the designer. If you're a designer, meet with the local reviewers early to discuss their green infrastructure projects, get that conversation going early, uh, work as a team to, uh, to get that product out there and design criteria. And this just isn't for private development. There's a lot of opportunities for government agencies to install green infrastructure, whether it's at our parks and our roadway right of ways. Um, we could always do better. A lot of times we just install these as pilot projects and to show what we're doing, but then we're not utilizing them in our everyday type uh, capital improvement projects. And then you guys could do all the best design work you want, but we as government agencies, if we don't provide good oversight during the installation, um, they can ruin all the best planning that's out there. So I do want to give one final plug. Justin mentioned the inspection and maintenance certification course. You go to our website to learn more about that. That's done with, uh, with Ohio State, who submits a certification upon passing the, the, um, the exam. We have two types of certification of professional professionals. There's just a professional like myself that would go out there and do the inspections. And then there's the professional contractor, which are made up of consulting engineers or contractors that um, are on the website and passed it and their businesses are there and available. So even if you have no interest in taking this course, if you work for, for city or county government, you could definitely direct um, other contractors that you work with or your HOAs and other people that need to maintain these for who they can reach out to to help them in their area. So that's it. My contact information is here. And um, Justin, I know we started late and I also went over another 10 minutes, but I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Brian. Uh, well done, sir. Appreciate, appreciate it. Um, so anyone have any questions, you can put it in the chat or you can, you can come on cam or unmute yourself if you want. But um, we'll answer any questions you have. Sure, hope uh, everyone enjoyed it. I yeah, appreciate you taking time. There's a lot of good information in that presentation. Well, thank you. Appreciate the feedback. Guys, have any questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, Justin, feel free to send out my contact information or reach out to Justin and him and I can discuss things. Um, you know, so and water, we all try to help each other out and help anyone for that matter. So please do not hesitate. And if I don't have an answer, I have a dozen people at my fingertips that will be more than willing. And uh, Dr. Ryan Winston is another great resource here in Ohio. Feel free to reach out to him too. You'll be sending out the slideshow presentation? I can. That'd be great. I mean, if Justin, if you don't mind sending it out, I can create it yeah. for you as a PDF. Sure, yes. If you send that over to me as a PDF, I'll email that out to the group with, um, I'll include your contact information, um, the YouTube video link, if anyone wants to share that with other people watch it we'll get that info sent out to you guys and i'll get those uh, certificates going as well for the pdh any other questions I'm not seeing any at the moment so oh denise says thank you you're welcome denise Appreciate my chance to get on my soapbox and and uh, preach about all the issues that we've had. <laughs> no, it's great. We can we can learn from your you know your your learnings. <laughs> <laughs> and if you guys have had any great successes, please feel free to share them with me. I'd love to learn more.
So, all right, I think we'll wrap it up here. Uh, again, um, you guys can also reach out if you have questions, but I uh, want to thank you so much, Brian Prunty with Summit County Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, so appreciate your time and, and everything. And yeah, we'll, we'll be in touch. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye.